ahead and get underway then. <clears throat> this is the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Everybody is welcome to attend this call, so long as you abide by the antitrust policy and uh, take care to be respectful to the other contributors. And you can find out more about that at our code of conduct, uh, which is linked on the agenda and a number of other places. Uh, Salona, would you like to take folks through the announcements? Um, sure. So, um, again, ongoing, the CICD committee with Dave Husey. If you want to join, please ping him about joining. Um, they're having regular meetings, and it looks like making a fair amount of progress. Um, we, uh, um, we're also upgrading our search, especially, and so we're looking for volunteers for helping with the upgrade. I think we're good with the fabric one because we're looking at upgrading fabric to the um, 1.41 raft protocol. Um, but we would like to get Sawtooth updated. I just had a really good phone call with Amal this morning at <laughs> 7 a.m. Central Time. Um, and he's going to also be recruiting some people for us to help with that. So if you know anyone, um, please let us know. Also, Dave has posted the rough draft of the readiness report. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to go ahead and read and comment um, at, because it'll be on the agenda for next week, not this week. We've got a pretty full thing for this week. So um, let hey, us know. Not to, yes. Oh, I wanted to jump in here and comment on this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, to come clean that I've been struggling with writing this. Um, if you go to that document, you'll notice that I have like three separate tracks or, you know, where I've attempted to it. So if you scroll down, <laughs> so that's t attempt number. Th Whoa, that's yeah. Okay. That's attempt number three. But if you scroll down, there's take two, <laughs> which was my previous attempt. And then there, if you keep scrolling down, there's, there's take one, which was my <laughs> previous attempt. So, um, the reason I've, I've tried three times at this document is because I, I have a lot to say about product readiness and project readiness and um, a lot of ideas about how we can measure this and how we can formalize it. But every time I start writing this, I realize I'm repeating a lot of what's already in the wiki about project lifecycle and exit criteria and all that kind of stuff. So my most recent try, which is at the top, I, I just focused on the things that we probably should do next, which is primarily we need to formalize the exit criteria from each of the stages and including like the first major release. And uh, Selena had a really good idea of developing basically like a questionnaire form, like the way the CII badge is done and um, focusing on that. So if we formalize sort of like the, the criteria so that teams, so it becomes like a self-service thing on the wiki teams can go through and fill out all their comments, you know, as a proposal of like, Hey, you know, we're good on this level um, moving on. But um, the thing I want to ask the TSC is, uh, you know, having a little more direction on exactly what you want out of this would help me take all those three previous tries and pare it down into something that um, is truly useful for all of us. Okay. So that's important context. So, uh, TSC members, please do take a directional look at that and make sure that, that some or all of that is uh, what was being asked for. If there's any reference that you can give to the original question that spawned that, feel free to send that to the list, Dave. Well, it, that was the thing. It was, it was just, hey, we need to take a look at project readiness and develop, you know, what does it mean to be ready? What are we already doing? What should we be doing? Um, and so that includes a lot of things like how do we measure and um, what, you know, okay, we measured things. What are good numbers? You know, what, if we have a bunch of numbers, what, what would constitute good numbers? And then, um, you know, definitions of all the product, project readiness stuff. So like take two, I started writing like an essay on this, you know, or like an encyclopedia post. And then I realized I was repeating a lot of the stuff that's already on the wiki when I started trying to pull in all the other pages. And so it was like, well, this is dumb. I'm repeating myself. So anyway, the, the original question was, what does it look like to be for a project to be ready? And, you know, it, it was very vague. 
So um, yeah, if anybody has any ideas on exactly what we want out of this, um, I'm, I'm all ears. The third try, I think, is closest to <clears throat> what we want, which is um, some light definitions, but then, you know, here's what we are doing and here's what we need to be doing. And um, yeah, yep. and feel free to edit and put notes in there and comments and just dump anything in there. But it's important that we get this right, but, you know, we have a lot of stuff on the wiki already around Project Readiness. It's just not necessarily called out directly with a head nod to, you know, if you follow the stuff that's in this document, okay. that'll help make the project ready, yeah. The projects themselves asked for this and some of the incoming projects have asked for this and that they don't always understand what the rules of the game are and they yeah. want to understand that better. And especially when they're trying to get ready, we notice that a bunch of them are like, well, we don't exactly understand how to get ready. And so I'm like, well, there's this, 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 this to read and they're just like, okay, we think we've got it, but oh, we've missed this, or oh, this is not right, and things of that nature. And so I'm like, okay, let's clarify it with some checklists and you know, possibly a form. And let's also you know, make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, because I do feel like having it scattered like that means that we do miss things. So right. that's why I asked for this proposal is because I actually had many different projects and, and even labs that want to get promoted to becoming projects, they care about this because, you know, in the end, everyone wants to become an active release. And so they want to under, they want to have more clarity on what that is and what the end goal is going to be. Yeah. And that's why I try number three is basically like, yeah. we should make questionnaires for each of these things and just, and then the TSE can decide what goes on those questionnaires. Um, because in the end, we vote on it, right? In the end, the yeah. TSC votes on it and decides whether or not it goes through. But right now, there's not enough clarity for incoming projects and different ones as to, they're like, well, what does the TSC vote on? <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, there's these things. And they're like, well, but that doesn't really okay. tell me. So, um, yeah, I would like to have that mm -hmm. more clear for people to understand. Okay. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it'd be good to have it clear for the TSC, too. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'll start a thread on the TSC mailing list and we, and we can talk more about it there. Perfect. All right. So moving along in our uh, uh, rather packed agenda here, we've got uh, a couple of project proposals. Uh, the first one has been uh, circulated on the mailing list uh, a week or so ago. Uh, so I hope everybody's had an opportunity to read through that. I'm going to. Uh, hand it over to uh, Sean Amundsen to uh, give an overview, and then we can have a bit of discussion on that. Uh, sure, so I'll, I'll keep the overview brief. I'm not gonna read the, the project proposal, um, but I'll just kind of describe uh, uh, at a high level what Transact, uh, kind of the, the role that it plays. Uh, so it's a library. Uh, that is intended to make uh, the execution of uh, smart contracts easier uh, and pluggable. Um, and so essentially what that means is um, taking a list of transactions um, and, and ending up with uh, a list of um, uh, resulting transaction receipts, which are the, the state changes. Um, and then being able to use those state changes uh, to uh, modify state. Um, so that, that sounds simple, but there's quite a lot uh, involved. Um, so uh, in, in Transact, uh, uh, you create a scheduler. Uh, the scheduler uh, uh, is, is essentially an ordered uh, list of transactions uh, where the, the scheduler determines what the actual execution order is. Um, there's uh, two, uh, two types, serial, and that's, um, you know, execute one at a time, essentially. Uh, and then the parallel scheduler where it uses hints about uh, well, places in state that will be read uh, uh, and written to um, to uh, do out of order execution, but it guarantees the same results as a serial scheduler. Um, there's an, an executor 
uh, component, which reads those transactions from the schedule as it is um, able to execute them. Uh, so it's a very uh, iterative process, like the transactions flow through. Uh, so the scheduler doesn't create a schedule up front, it's, it's uh, iterative. Um, and the executor uh, basically marshals it to uh, smart contract engines. Uh, so a couple examples of smart contract engines um, that exist currently uh, are uh, Seth, which is uh, a smart contract engine uh, in uh, Sawtooth. Uh, within Sawtooth currently, it's called the Transaction Processor. Uh, but within Transact, uh, it's a different terminology. Um, but essentially, that one executes EVM smart contracts uh, using Burrow. Uh, and then another example is Sabre, uh, and that executes um, uh, WebAssembly code. Um, and we can, you know, envision quite a lot of uh, of different smart contract engines over time. Um, you know, one for DAML, for example, but, you know, the, the, the list is kind of endless uh, as, as to what, what those could be. Um, and that's intentional because we're kind of taking the position um, that we don't know what, uh, you know, the, the perfect uh, VM or uh, uh, interpreter is to use, and so they're pluggable. Um, the uh, executor uh, also services uh, um, in any interaction with with state uh, using a context manager component. And essentially, uh, how that works is that the transactions are uh, isolated uh, in that there's a, a specific state that the transaction is is run against. Um, and the context manager uh, helps um, uh, with that isolation, essentially. Um, yeah, and then the, the results flow uh, backward from that all the way back through the scheduler to the, the calling code uh, in the form of re receipts. Um, receipts can have uh, a few things. Um, it can have uh, the list of state changes uh, obviously, because that's kind of the overall goal. Uh, but it can also have generated um, uh, events uh, uh, that are um, contained in the receipt. And so that can be used to generate events for clients, for example. Um, and then uh, there's a couple other fields uh, to support, like uh, attaching arbitrary like data and stuff like that uh, to send back to clients. Um, uh, and then the calling code would take those receipts and apply them against against state. Uh, so the calling code is is kind of in charge of maintaining uh, maintaining the uh, the interaction with state. Um, so that's kind of the uh, maybe quick uh, technical overview. Um, you know, as a library project, uh, just a, a few more points and then, then um, we can get into uh, questions. And uh, So, uh, yeah, as a, as a library project, the goal here is to create a reusable component. Uh, so it's, it's really, really heavily inspired by uh, the code that we have in Sawtooth today. Um, but the reason that we uh, envision this as a library project is, uh, you know, to kind of uh, uh, make it easier for other projects to consume it. Um, we know two projects that uh, for sure will consume it, um, Grid and Sawtooth, um, uh, and, and we hope uh, Fabric and other projects will, uh, will use the library as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the motivation uh, behind creating creating it as a library and a distinct component. Okay, thanks, Sean. And I think um, like to give Gary a chance to to sort of wrap that up, and then we can move into feedback from TSC. 
TSC members. Looks like Brian will probably want to get in before the other TSC members, but uh, Gary uh, is not in the room with me, but uh, he's one of the other sponsors on this project, so I wanted to uh, give him an opportunity to, to say a couple words before we move into that. You know, starting to have some some common some common. Oh, I guess I'm unmuted now, right? Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you might want to get ready to mute me again now. Um, uh, <laughs> of, of having a common component, um, and, and I think you know we've we've looked you know in, in fabric at various things, you know, different transaction processing models. Um, you know, we're very interested in things like Wasm and other smart contract models, and we plugged in um, we, we plugged in the uh, as well. Um, so this looks, you know, very intriguing, right? Um, in terms of, you know, devil's in the details, but, um, I, you know, I think we can definitely, you know, look to see a path forward on how we could do this and um, it makes sense for to, to try to get involved up front on this. So um, I, I think this is a, you know, this, is a, this will be a, if we can pull this off, uh, this will be a, a great accomplishment. Okay, great. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Brian? Um, and these aren't important points, but A, um, we have started to talk uh, amongst the staff about maybe reformatting the categorization between frameworks and tools into maybe kind of a, a slightly richer categorization. So the suggestion that this is more of a library, you know, kind of in the same way that grid is kind of templates and libraries, you know, is, is very much welcome. And we won't try to shoehorn this into, you know, the existing thing, I think. You know what we maybe want to do in a future TSC call is talk about maybe you know what is if we were to make it four categories rather than two uh, of projects high pleasure what would it be um, so just bookmark that and then secondly um, if we could find uh, a different name um, I think there are quite a few people who'd be happier about that um, uh, and uh, earlier as we've you know found in the past is better to try to sort this out um, so I, I don't know how wedded attached people are to the name um, or if they're open to a, a an open process for picking a new one um, of course these are completely insubstantial when it comes to the technical details of the proposal but um, just wanted to highlight them now okay thanks Brian um, so yeah, before we get into maybe some of those those details about how we uh, name it and, and uh, put it into the, the broader nomenclature, uh, are there clarifying questions from members of the technical steering committee? Um, this is Nathan. I have a question. Um, first, I'd like to echo Gary's sentiment that this project seems really interesting to us in the Indy project. Um, we currently don't have a a sandbox for transaction or smart contract execution. And as the proposal mentions, there's some interesting possibilities for including uh, secure computing functionality through an interface like this in Indy's agent layer. Um, and then my question was, um, in terms of support in a cross project way, um, do you have any developers or contributors who are engaged in the requirements gathering process or supporting the project beyond Sawtooth? Um, yeah, I th I, the expectation uh, is to work with Gary on the fabric stuff and, and his team to, to make sure that, for example, the transaction receipts um, that, um, that, that we end up with can be translated into read-write sets and that it just generally makes sense in, in terms of uh, fabrics architecture. Yeah, and, and this is Jonathan Levi. I, I will probably join it as well as a time to meeting. Yeah. Some more support from the fabric side. That's great. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we did have well-rounded support from, from that entire part of the community. Um, Mr. Wagner has his hand up. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um, so I guess what's not clear to me, um, and it seems to have pretty broad support, is how much of this is code that's being lifted out of something and how much of this is uh, starting from scratch um, you know, Sean made the comment it was heavily inspired from Sawtooth. Um, I'm just trying to understand where, where are things at? Are we trying to take something out of A and put it into B? Or, you know, is it already there? Yeah, it's, a, it's a little blurry. Uh, so, um, not blurry, but it's, it's um, 
the the design is substantially uh, the same as what's in Sawtooth currently. But what we have in Sawtooth is Python, and Sawtooth itself is moving to Rust. Uh, so what we've done is is kind of taken the opportunity, um, knowing that we were going to present this, uh, to uh, start a reimplementation uh, in Rust. So that that's listed. Um, the, the URL is in the back section. I think the last the last part of the proposal. Um, and so that code is uh, does not contain all of the the features. For example, there's um, there's not yet a parallel scheduler, um, but it is able to run uh, Sawtooth transactions now um, uh, with with some work. Uh, the APIs are slightly different. We're trying to make it. Uh, we're trying to use the opportunity to uh, make it friendlier for uh, other frameworks, uh, and so. Uh, the APIs are not not precisely the same, and so we're focusing in that Rust library on, on backwards compatibility. Um, but as we go through it, the design uh, is is really translating um, what's in Sawtooth now, and then updating it with um, with with uh, the ideas uh, kind of driven by uh, being a, a more reusable uh, library component. Okay, thank you. All right, looks like the, uh, the eminent Dr. Bowman would like to uh, speak. Oh, oh boy. Um, so I get, so uh, we, we've talked a lot in the past about sort of cross-platform projects and, and um, uh, I love uh, architecture and transact and the approach that, that you propose, Sean. Um, I think, as you know, I think it's great work. Um, my as a as a high level project and and one of the the real values in this to hyperledger as a community is the, is again the sort of cross platform availability um, that doesn't happen by accident um, as we've seen in the past with um, you know projects we've sort of encouraged to be cross project that have not quite gone down that direction. Um, so I really have two questions. A high level one, which which I think is is the same as what Mark was asking, and others is, um, you know, what will be done um, to encourage participation from other groups actively. And the second question, which is which is related, is really transact itself looks great. How much work do you expect uh, for a platform to? be able to adopt it and who will own the pieces of this that's um, that's required to do the integration to Fabric or Indie or, or, or well, Satu's done, but so who, who does that work and how hard is it? Yeah, so um, to, the, to the first one, like how to foster like participation. Um, so I, I, I think like, um, you know, we've, we've learned a lot with, uh, with Sawtooth and Grid on how to uh, essentially get um, uh, more community uh, participation. And so I would expect kind of uh, continuing with uh, some of the things that we're doing there. Um, the uh, primary one is uh, writing up um, RFCs for changes in the, in the framework and then soliciting uh, feedback in kind of a very, very structured way. And so that gives an opportunity um, uh, that otherwise might not exist for people to to read what the plan uh, plan to change is and then comment. Um, uh, so, for for example, one of the the things that Transact doesn't have support for now that that we're uh, about to write in our C four is uh, mul multiple database support, right? And so, like that'll be put out as as an RFC and everyone can uh, can comment and then um, we can iterate on, on the RFC um, uh, as, as a way to have kind of design artifacts uh, uh, used as, as discussion points. And that's been working really well um, uh, in, in Sawtooth. Uh, it's really driven better behavior uh, for the, the, the core developers to have to document their ideas. Um, so Okay, and, and then to the second point, 
um, a second question about who owns uh, integrations that would be the, the projects themselves because this is a, a library project uh, it would not know about grid or sawtooth or fabric it's really providing a capability kind of in the same way that um, versus providing a capability um, so the the uh, maintainers of, of transact might not know the the internal workings of um, uh, all, all the other projects right so it would be kind of hard for them to maintain it but the um, the general idea of it being a library is it's making a certain set of functionality easier uh, and so the the expectation uh, uh, that I have is because it makes it easier that's the motive that's part of the motivation for uh, using the library so um, uh, within sawtooth right we'll have we'll have less code to do this right and so um, so there will be motivation to maintain the library on uh, from the, the sawtooth community um, uh, like Nathan alluded to like they don't currently have uh, uh, this capability within uh, indie agents but um, you know uh, hopefully this library will uh, kind of provide like an easy way to get there without writing uh, a, a ton of code to do it where it's like real like literally create a, a scheduler and add some transactions and get the results back that's like you know, like the API uh, should be like really easy to consume uh, and I think the difficult part for projects is figuring out um, not how to use the library but where it fits within their architecture uh, since the architectures are all very uh, very different uh, but I, but I think that's part of um, keep, keeping the the design philosophy of it's a library and, and we don't know every single way that it can be used we just know that um, that, that what it's used for is is running transactions and getting the, the results back um, and, and keeping it pure uh, in that sense. Great. Uh, Hart? Sure. Um, thanks for presenting, Sean. Um, I had a question. Do you guys have any API documentation? Um, uh, it, it's not up. It's like in the... Um, in the trans transact repo itself, the uh, you can generate uh, Rust doc. Where is it? I couldn't find it in your uh, in your repo. Uh, it's in the code. So like the, the the API documentation is like comments on the the documented uh, uh, functions and stuff like that. So for those unfamiliar with Rust, how would you generate that? Yeah, you're on like Carbo Rust doc. Um, yeah, so we would publish that. Uh, it probably needs more examples and stuff like that. Um, but since we know it's a library, we've made some attempts to make sure that, that the, the functions are, are documented and that'll continue. Okay, yeah, I think for, um, at least for Ursa, one of the things that people have found useful was we have like a whole docs repo. Um, you know, okay, uh, a separate repository for building the, the documentation that isn't docs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I was just curious about that. Be just sort of uh, <clears throat> on the ledger integration stuff, but uh, but I don't want to go too deeply into that here. So, anyways, thanks. This looks really cool. Okay, uh, I think. Jonathan uh, wanted to, to say a bit more. Yeah, so I, I think in order to keep the nature of the project and the spirit of, of, of Transact, I think, I, I don't know, I'm just, I don't want to burst into an open door, but maybe we should allocate some time for Transact to do what Transact needs to do. And then at some point, if we really want to integrate with other projects, we will have to set up joint milestones so that if, let's say, Fabric 2.2, I'm just throwing a number here, we need to change the ordering service or, or stuff like that that we look at the read write set we'll be able to kind of look at the timeline of transact and then if something is mature enough only then or, or maybe closely before that to change or amend or, or basically interact with transact through the development process of each specific project so maybe to first kind of grow you know like develop the personality of the project 
so the transaction is something a little bit more mature and only and, and, and aligned with that we can influence a bit in terms of the API especially the ones that know each specific project uh, but at some point we will have to you know because if you have like a common library that extends functionality for let's say four projects then we will also need to impose some restrictions at some point later on down the line right because we will rely will depend on each other right imagine us using OpenSSL so if OpenSSL changes API we need to change so we need to think about like a period of developing transact and then another period of having the cross dependencies in a way you know it's not going to be completely clean when two parts are moving apart and just the APIs because it will be different levels and maturity of the functionalities provided, I, I believe, right? Transacting 0 0.9 and Fabric is 2.2, .2, what do we do? You, you know what I mean? So, uh, just, just something to think in mind, uh, to keep in mind that we are uh, yeah, designing and developing it, is that I have to be friendly for all this to embrace it. Okay, those are good thoughts on how we manage dependencies across projects and, and how groups would want to try to align their, their release milestones. We should keep those in mind as we uh, mature the projects. Um, and Ben, I saw that you have uh, questions in the doc. Uh, those might be too low level for, uh, it might be better just to respond within the doc on those, I'm not sure, but I uh, wanted to make sure that you're uh, able to ask those or if there's anything higher level. Hey, Dan, I wanted to follow on to Jonathan's point a little bit, if I could. Um, let me Smart. just give Ben okay. a second and then we can come back to yeah. you. Yeah, for, for um, yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, for, for the question that I have there, I, I think we can take that um, offline or part of the doc. Um, as, as I understood more uh, reading down uh, the document here, um, so I, I, I think my my understanding that the introduction uh, paragraph there was uh, was different now <laughs> now that uh, been able to to read more. Uh, but but I do have uh, I do have a question whether uh, whether Kanyak takes into consideration for multi stage execution because in fabric uh, at the time. At the time the smart contract executes the transaction, it is a simulation to generate retry set. Uh, it is not the time that the the uh, you know the transformation get committed. Uh, you know the commitment of the the retry set would happen later on after the consensus, because the consensus will will take into account uh, that retry set as part of uh, the endorsement policy. So it's actually multi-stage, if you will, execution. Um, yeah, so whether, that, yeah, that's right. yeah, so my, my question is whether that is, if, if there's any capabilities or feature that allow fabric to, to do that kind of thing. Yeah, so if you look at the, the, the process, uh, or the, there's a diagram in the, the bottom that has like the distributed ledger implementation second diagram, um, the distributed ledger is actually in control of like when to apply um, the, the state changes, um, which would presumably be converted to read write sets uh, for Fabric. Um, uh, and, and that's a conscious decision we made when uh, kind of refactoring this into the transact code from the Sawtooth stuff is to separate that step. Uh, because in Sawtooth, um, the, the scheduler actually applies the state change. Uh, and, and, and we, our understanding of, uh, of fabric uh, is such that we thought that that wouldn't work. And so uh, we decoupled um, that step and so that you can generate the receipts. And then what you do with the receipts is, is up to the distributed ledger uh, implementation. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Okay, Bao please. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, basically, I think it's a good idea to have some shared library across different uh, projects. Um, the major concern is, um, uh, you know, we have a ledger have uh, 
already five uh, frameworks. They have been implemented within different languages like uh, uh, Fabric is with Go and uh, Salt with Python and also different protocols. Fabric using the gRPC and the other products may using other RPC or REST API. So I think it might be a challenge for the transact to define these uh, some unique uh, API to be uh, work with different uh, frameworks. There, there's no details in such details in the proposal. I think we can we can improve uh, with uh, providing some uh, API and uh, how to like how to handle with different protocols or languages. That that will be better. Yeah. If, 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 if I could say something on that one too, I, I know where you're coming from on that, but I think, and Sean, you know, you can correct, please feel free to uh, correct me where I'm wrong, but I, I don't think the purpose was actually to, I mean, if you kind of read um, in the document, right, I think those things would all stand outside, right? I, I think if you're talking about working on specific entry points, like in and out, th they should be actually protocol agnostic, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the engine itself has kind of defined inputs of, you know, basically the states and what's coming in in a format that's in there. Smart contracts will have, uh, you know, specific to, to their engine runtimes. So, I mean, this is, I mean, a similar analog here would be if for some, like there's like, as an example, technically it would take labor. There's probably no technical reason as an example that in fabric we couldn't have taken or, you know, transaction processors, right? And figured out a way to integrate them in. Now, of course, we won't need to do that because we're taking the core, underlying core, you know, slimming that down to a, a, a more flexible component. So, so I don't think we would want to get into uh, things like gRPC and COM and communication protocol here. Um, I think this is just wrapping additional layers around what would have been like how we, how everybody chose to integrate in something like, uh, like, like the EVM, for example, right? Um, so so I, I, I think that all that stuff, all that plumbing is outside and up to the consuming one to, to, to get traffic in and out. And then all we do is, you know, pass it into here where appropriate. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, and, and I think like if we, if we need to do wrappers from uh, Go to Rust, which seems like the, the most likely, um, uh, I feel like that's something that we can we can uh, accomplish and like maintain as part as part of the project. That uh, if you're calling yeah. into library code, we we just have a a Go API um, that can be consumed by uh, by Fabric and um, Sawtooth uh, and and Indy are both uh, uh, heavily Rust uh, at this point. So Sawtooth is um, Partially still Python right now, but that's going to go away uh, over time. Uh, and so, really, we we only care about um, uh, Rust. And I think uh, it's um, uh, Go and Rust are are going to be fairly compatible in terms of us um, making that yeah. transition uh, through like an FFI layer. Okay, thanks. So we're we're down fairly low, which is I think a good sign. Um, Mark did have uh, a follow-up that he wanted on Jonathan's comments on release alignment. And I think that'll be the last comment that we'll have an opportunity to take right now. Uh, for members want to give some indication on, on Rocket Chat, whether you'd like additional discussion at a later time, or whether you're satisfied with the discussion up to this point, please uh, take some time to do that. Uh, and go ahead, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one thing, and and this does not go against this proposal at all um, in my mind you know it's not going to hold it up in my mind but in general I think we need to be careful um, when we start doing libraries and all these different languages because we will run into dependency hell down the down the road if you know this goes into fabric and fabrics using a version of go that's based on a certain version of GCC and this is built on another one you you will end up in, in trouble down the road so I think we just need to be careful of things like that over time. Um, I've seen that with some of the Ethereum products I've tried to build. So, um, it, 
you know, like I said, I don't want it to influence, you know, I'm not saying we should change this or anything, but I think it's just something we need to be careful of down the road. Yeah. Okay. One, one way to address that is to get into a regular, I mean, like the Eclipse community does, right, where they have like a yearly release where they do a major point release and then kind of a, a, a regular kind of heartbeat of minor point releases, um, kind of adopting a quarterly release cycle here that maybe we try to sync um, some of the to projects. Be honest, Brian, but, but let's be kind of finding about that. I don't know. That, yeah, we have I a long-term support when we don't change APIs and then we have like, you know, like, like the 2.0 will break some APIs. We announce and tell everybody. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to say everyone had to follow Fabric. I was just saying that, um, fa yes, Fabric has that. And no, 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 I mean a long-term release really cycle in general with a short-term, like with a short milestone. So not, not to follow Fabric, but just to follow the process maybe. We already have one in place. Okay, uh, I think that's probably a good note to conclude on. Um, we, we're missing a, a few people from the call. I, I suppose I should chime in for those who haven't looked at uh, uh, Silas did send a note to the mail list in, in support there. I think probably what we'll do is uh, go to the mail list after this. Um, but I want to allocate enough time for um, for taking a look at the next proposal. Uh, so a few further comments on this, feel free to hit the chat or the mail list and then we might uh, take up a vote there if it seems like everybody is, is ready to go with, with that on the mail list. And uh, we will now abruptly change over to a proposal from Nathan uh, that was posted onto the agenda um, yesterday, I think. So hopefully some people have had a chance to look at it. I personally haven't had an opportunity uh, so Nathan, if you want to maybe give us a bit of an introduction uh, and we can go from there in our remaining 15 minutes. Absolutely. Um, first, I'd like to welcome a bunch of the maintainers on the project who've been working for quite some time inside of the Indie Agent Working Group. Um, we have John Jordan, um, Stephen Curran, and Sam Curran on the call, um, along with a few others. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to help with some of the questions you might have as well. Um, we have been uh, working on Indy for quite some time, and there's, as you might know, there's two different types of interactions that occur, occur within the Indy platform right now. Uh, the first interaction is the one that most of us are very familiar with in blockchain platforms, where when you want to set up a network, you want a trusted oracle for some information that's shared amongst multiple parties. So you set up a bunch of nodes, and then you start doing transactions and storing state. Um, in uh, digital identity, there's that's the interaction that's probably um, the lesser of the two in terms of what, what it is you're trying to do to accomplish your use case. At the W3C, we call the part that goes on the ledger a verifiable data registry. Um, and what Indy's main focus is, is to provide a blockchain that has the right qualities to accomplish that trusted oracle that lets one context, context make cryptographic commitments for interacting with someone who's in a different context. Um, and then they can use verifiable credentials to share the information between them. Um, as we've built out that platform, the portion for the two identity owners um, making those commitments and then interacting with each other independent of that blockchain has gotten larger and larger. Um, and we find ourselves in a position where that portion of the code base is, is dominating a lot of the discussions with, within India itself. And we've started to find lots of applicability and use cases um, for that technology and that code in particular that spans well beyond Indy um, and uh, needs to be use, usable and used in places that um, don't need to share concerns with this, the portion that is Indy itself. Um, so an example of this is you might have a blockchain that wants to use decentralized identifiers or did support um, in order to share the information on its chain with people who don't know about its Genesis transaction block. Um, certainly, the, the indie portion is good for anchoring the credential definitions and the schemas and things to verify and validate that data, but the protocol is required to sign those credentials and share that data across from one party to another party is very different than the code that goes into building the indie blockchain itself. And that's really the, the portions that we're talking about when we talk about splitting out um, uh, agent interaction or wallet interactions from indie into this new project we're calling Aries. Um, there's a, if we scroll down, um, Rai, to the diagram that's within the project proposal, that's probably the easiest thing to talk to for those who aren't as familiar with this project proposal. Um, 
we end up with inside of Indy a resolver layer that lets you um, interact with the data model and anchor the right objects to, the, to a blockchain. Um, and Indy certainly can continue to host those sorts of resolver implementations for both the Indy blockchain and other blockchains at, at Hyperledger as, as we see fit. Um, but more, more interestingly, um, we end up with the credentials exchange protocol for doing this trusted information interaction uh, and a resolver interface that lets us interact with the types of transactions that might be on a ledger, whether they be the verifiable data registry set of transactions or whether they be value transfer transactions like transferring Bitcoin, Bitcoins or, or Ether from one party to another. Um, we end up with a portion of the code that interacts with URSA to gain its crypto, crypto functionality and then um, does secrets management and interaction between more than one instance of the software to, to be able to back up and recover those secrets and to be able to share information in a trusted way between, um, between parties. Um, so uh, there's a lot of notes in the project proposal about how we think the interaction with Indy and Air, between Indy and Aries work going forward and also how that interaction between Aries and URSA um, happens to build a reusable framework that we can use kind of as a, an edge client toolkit um, to build um, a client that could interact with a fabric blockchain or interact with uh, a sawtooth blockchain or interact with Indy or interact with other systems um, that, that do verifiable credentials um, information exchange. So I think with that introduction, um, obviously the project proposal I think is about nine pages long when we had it in, in Google Docs. So there's quite a bit of content there. I think the, the, the best thing to do is probably to take questions um, and, uh, and go from there. So Nathan, um, I think one opportunity with this project is to bring in um, other parts of the, let's call it the identity community that aren't necessarily engaged with Hyperledger. Um, can you comment on the advantages that you see in this project for the ability to do that and maybe um, also how Ursa may or may not encourage their participation. Absolutely. Um, we've seen a lot of interest in Ursa from the blockchain side of the community. Um, the verifiable credentials community is just w working on wrapping up the data model specification for verifiable credentials exchange. And a lot of that spec is not currently in scope inside of Indy because Indy has a particular opinion about how that interaction occurs. Um, separating Aries out of its, into its own project allows us to expand the scope of what we support to encompass a broader um, set of what's going on in the standards body. You know, we expect code contributions for resolvers for um, some of the other ledgers that are working at doing decentralized I identity. Um, we're also, we've had a lot of interests expressed in supporting JWT style verifiable credentials which will expand the reach of how uh, the code can be integrated into other platforms around the web. Um, and uh, by having Indy be independent of Aries, um, it lets those contributors know that, that those pieces of functionality are clearly in scope um, and th those co contributions are more than welcome and also helps build that um, compatibility with URSA for, that, for URSA to become more widely available to some of the digital identity platforms besides the, the blockchain server side um, part of the system. Okay, great. Um, and I hope, I, th I think you mentioned uh, separately that you might have some, there's uh, some, some meetings occurring next week where you might be able to draw in some support from, from some of those other communities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, next week is the um, Internet Identity Workshop in Mountain View, California, and we're hoping to have kind of uh, some preliminary approval, at least on the project, so that we can better socialize that this is a pl place that they're welcome to collaborate and contribute to, um, to help kind of build support for um, more cross-framework um, interoperability in, in, at a library code level. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the standards organizations to build that sort of compatibility, but not as much practical code um, being written as we would like. And uh, the Hyperledger community has been the best place we've had to, to incubate that community. Um, the agent calls regularly have uh, 20 to 30 participants every week. Um, and that is basically the basis for this community for the Hyperledger Aries project. 
So it, all the, the folks you see listed in the sponsors are all already active when their organizations are making um, contributions either through documentation or um, obviously leadership in terms of hel helping gather requirements, especially with VIPN and the work that's been going on in the identity working group. So the hope here is that we, it allows us to pull more of those folks in to be actually writing code um, and shipping things that build the, the, the basis for um, uh, applications and tools that, that sit on top, which is the yellow box here in this diagram. Great. So if there's others participating uh, in that meeting next week, I'd encourage you to help uh, get some more eyes and interaction on the proposal. Uh, give Nathan a hand with that. Um, I see Brian's hand is up. Yeah, uh, first, thank you for following the format for the project proposals. Um, that makes it easier to review and, and, and have this conversation. Um, and thank you for having um, a, a good name. Um, and uh, for those uh, listening who um, may be encouraged to support one of the proposals today and not the other, I would suggest approving both. That way we avoid having 13 projects uh, in Hyperledger, um, just for anyone who's numerically uh, um, superstitious. Um, at least we got past four projects, which is an uh, unlucky unlucky number in China um, pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited about this and, and would love to see it um, get started. Okay, any other uh, clarifying questions in our remaining couple minutes here? Uh, just to say quickly that I didn't mean that we should all follow Fabi's schedule just to try to see if that process works for other projects. Just to make sure that it does not make sense. Jonathan, I don't think we can all follow fabric schedule under the way. Okay, um, I don't see any other immediate questions uh, from, from anybody out there. So I think we'll go ahead and wind down and please take your questions for uh, the second proposal to the, the wiki where it's, it's housed or to the mailing list. And then I think we'll look at having more discussion on that uh, next week after people have had an opportunity to dig a little deeper and, and maybe there's some more feedback from the, the conference next week. Uh, and we will uh, also turn to the mail list for the uh, transact proposal. Well, uh, Vipin has his hand up there. So Vipin, you get to uh, take us out here. Yeah. I'm I'm a sponsor on the ARIES project. I was very impressed with the presentation that Nathan gave at uh, Identity Working Group meeting. So if you want a longer discourse on ARIES, there is always the um, recording to turn to. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I think this uh, ARIES proposal is very powerful because it is taking us towards adoption, which is the most important thing. Okay, great. Well, if you wouldn't mind uh, copying the link to that recording into the chat, that would probably be for convenient for people to access. Uh, thank you everybody for your time and engagement in today's call, and we will hear from everybody on the mail list and uh, again next week. Thanks.